In this video, I'll be going through the task three section of an individual's and society's paper. So it's a continuation of task one and task two that I previously uploaded. So it's all part of the same paper. So in this task, you'll explore the key concept of time, place, and space, and use your critical thinking skills to analyze the impact of globalization on peace and conflict around the world. Your responses will be assessed using criterion A, C, and D. And in the following questions, you will consider the usefulness of source C to an MYP student studying trends in peace and conflict. So this type of question is quite common in section C. It'll involve a source evaluation in which you'll normally be asked uh, to analyze a source in relation to its origin, purpose, values, and limitation to an MYP student studying some sort of topic, which is normally related to what the questions are asking you. So let's take a look at source C over here. We can see that it shows the global peace index around the world. So it shows the levels of peace uh, for many countries and it's color coded accordingly, uh, depending on whether the level of peace is very high or very low. And it shows this for 2008, 2013, as well as 2018. So let's take a look at what questions they give us. The first question, state the origin of source C. So the origin is basically just the author or creator of the source. You can see that it can be a name of a person. It can be an organization. So for here, you can see it's quite obviously stated down here, Institute for Economics and Peace. Normally, the origin is very easy to find, and it's an easy one mark. The next question would be state the purpose of source C. The purpose of a source looks at why the source was created. So in order to determine the purpose of the source, you'll have to look at what information is included in the source and how the source communicates information. So normally, the purpose of a source can be to either inform, explain, persuade, or entertain. For individuals in society, normally, you wouldn't see entertain. That's more towards, lang more towards language and literature, where you'll see literary text. So your options would be more more narrowed down to inform, explain, and persuade. Usually it would be inform, explain, persuade, but it also depends on how you um, present your answer. There are many answers that could be accepted, but one possible answer is to inform the audience of the level of peace of many different countries across the world. And list two values of source C for an MYP student studying trends um, in peace and conflict. Normally, when they ask you to mention values, it would normally be to explain. If they ask you to explain, normally one value is enough, and you just have to be able to, you just have to make sure you explain that one value thoroughly. If they ask you to list two values, you only get one mark for each value, so you have to list two. But it's more common for them to tell you to explain value or values. It's up to you whether you want to include one or two, but one would be enough to give you the marks. So normally when it comes to evaluating values and also limitations of sources, there are many things that you can consider. You can consider the content of what's included in the source. So you consider the accuracy and objectivity of the information included, the numbers of perspectives included, and the depth of those perspectives. You can also consider the origin. You can see who created the source. Is there any bias? from the person who created that source? Like what's the profession? What's the organization? Is there any chance that could have induced any bias? How recent was the source um, released? And the country author, what's the uh, expertise and reliability of the source and author? And if there are any citations? And of course you can also look at the purpose because here they already mentioned that the values for an MYP student studying trends in peace and conflict. So you can use this as a piece of information to sort of see what would an MYP student want from this source, an MYP student studying this, what would they want from this source, what is missing from the source that they may want to know. It'll help you think of values and limitations to include. So examples of values would be that information on the level of peace is provided for a variety of countries which allows better comparison for the MYP student. It's always good to write in a sense where you're doing this for the MYP student rather than just general values. And the level of peace for each country is given across a variety of years, which provides information on how the level of peace can change over time. 
And similarly, can list two limitations of source C for an MYP student studying trends in peace and conflict. So a common misconception is that limitations has means that there has to be something wrong with the source, but it could easily be something that's missing from the source that could help the MYP student. For example, information on level of peace within the countries are not mentioned. There's no saying that the same level of peace can be seen throughout each part of the country. And there's also no information detailing how these values and level of peace was determined in the first place. So it's difficult to justify why certain countries have such a level of peace to begin with. And that's it for the source evaluation. After this, there'll normally be an essay question for you to answer in this section. So we'll look at source C and source D below, source C here, source D here, and answer the question that follows. Using source C and source D, analyze the trends in peace and conflict between 2008 and 2018. So this question is six marks, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to write a lot. You'll have to sort of make use of what information the sources give gives you. You have to sort of use the countries, the years, everything here. And you can tell by source D that they also want you to talk about conflict and why these countries have that level of peace. So you'll have to use keywords from um, these causes here. So a sample answer could be this. The number of conflicts has increased by 2018. Some regions have seen an increase in instability, for instance, Africa, Middle East, South America, that can be linked to different reasons like conflicts over resources or political power. So we can see in 2018, this section, there are more red areas, which shows that there's very low levels of peace. So we connect this to possible causes of reasons. So we mentioned here over resources or political power. Political power and resources are mentioned here. So you should always use keywords from the sources given to you. It's also possible to see that some countries are consistently, uh, consistently peaceful because there's an ideological stability ideology and their territory is not under duress. There are plenty of resources in these areas and these are normally shared well. So richer countries are definitely less prone to conflicts. So you make good use of both the sources and you give different perspectives in your answer. Usually in this section, perspectives is a very important thing to consider. And then the last question, the essay question, look at source E below and answer the question that follows. Some argue that globalization leads to peace, while others argue that it's more likely to co cause conflict. The question states, write a well-structured essay to answer the following question. To what extent does globalization promote peace? So generally, quite a lot of the times, to what extent is a common command term used in um, this essay question? And a lot of the times when you get to what extent, it's normally an argumentative writing that they're asking you to do. So when it's an argumentative writing, what I like to do is I like to use the Tolman model. It's sort of a model that helps you organize your entire essay, consider different perspectives and everything. I'll just give a general breakdown of the uh, model and later go back to the essay to show you how I used it. The first part would be the intro. In the intro, you consider any, you define any key terms and concepts used in the question given to you. And you also question the stance that's expressed in the essay prompt. After this, you go to your claim, you state what's your point, what's your stance. And when you state your stance, avoid using I, unless the question explicitly asks you to ask you to give your personal stance, you should maybe use something like it is believed that rather than I believe that, something like that. And similar to language and literature, if you've watched that video, the P-E-E-L model is still a very good model to use in order to organize your answer. You state your point, you give an evidence to support your claim, and you give an explanation as to how the pieces of evidence support the claim. And you briefly link your arguments and state how well your points support your stance. When it comes to evidence in INS, normally they're referring to real-life examples of things that happen in the real world. 
So you should always have that sort of knowledge and use to make connections with whatever question they're asking you. So the first paragraph is the intro. Second paragraph is the claim. Next paragraph would be the counterclaim. Here you state the opposite claim. You agree or disagree with the view expressed in that you agreed or disagreed with the view expressed in the essay prompt. So you sort of go against the claim that you mentioned because we want to consider different perspectives because the command term is to what extent. They're not asking you to agree or disagree, but to consider different perspectives and come to a conclusion. So you give sort of a counter argument and you follow the same model. You give your point, your explanation, your evidence and explanation. And you also should give a rebuttal, which is the fourth paragraph, in which you rebut the counterclaim, which is supporting your claim. And the same model, PEE. And finally, your conclusion. So you can summarize your best evidence to support your judgment and provide a final answer to the question that was raised in the introduction. So this model is generally very good to use, but you shouldn't always jump to this model. You need to understand the prompt, what they're asking you to do. If you feel like it's asking for an argumentative writing, this is generally a good model to use. So they say in your answer, you must include examples to support your argument, generally real life examples and consider different perspectives. This is automatically covered when you put your mind to this model. So going to the answer that's included here, So I start by defining some terms. If we go back to the question, to what extent does globalization promote peace? The key terms here are globalization and peace. So you should be defining these two terms. So define globalization and define peace. And after that, you question the, you question what the question is asking. Basically, you question the stance expressed in the essay prompt. So to what extent does globalization actually promote peace? You can pretty much just copy whatever they give you here. And then after you give your claim. So it is believed rather than I believe that globalization does promote peace. You don't necessarily have to follow the order of point evidence explanation. As long as you include it in a sort of structure, you can include it in any order. So I generally start with an explanation of one point for globalization. And then after this, I go to an example for in the European Union. So I use a real life example to support my point. And then nevertheless, I'm going against my point and providing something that people may argue against the claim that I give and the point that I raised up. So I provided that as a, a counterclaim and I gave an explanation as to why it's a counterclaim. And of course, uh, you go through a real life example. So here I included the Arab Spring as my real life example. And then finally, next you go to the rebuttal. So while it is true that blah, 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 it's still trade could also be whatever could also be. You go back to your claim, you support your claim once again. And of course, you need to include examples in order to make your point stronger. And after that, you conclude all your evidence, and then you give a sort of, even, even if they uh, ask you to sort of, uh, even if your claim is something, you don't necessarily have to always just say only your claim is correct. You can say it's like this, but it's also like this. So in conclusion, it could be something like this. That's generally the format you should be following. And there's just some extra parts here. So what I wrote as the content itself doesn't really matter, but it's just the um, the the organization, how you structure your answer, as well as knowledge on real life examples that you should know because this the same question won't be coming for the exam. But otherwise, yeah, I think that's it for this question. Generally, this is what task three is like. Good luck for the individuals and societies examination tomorrow.